Okay, so I, I will admit <coughs> that is one beautiful baby. Almost as beautiful as my grandkids, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, that baby is not related to me. That's the calmest kid. All of mine would have been yelling and kicking and screaming and wanting to grab the microphone. So um, I want you to see a video, uh, and uh, it's just for fun. It has nothing to do really with what I'm talking about. Well, it kind of does, because here's, here's, if I'm Timothy, and I'm getting this letter from the Apostle Paul, I've already requested for a transfer because I'm, I'm, I'm way out over my skis on this assignment. Um, then uh, my question is, okay, great. So be a cathedral builder and these things in trust of faith. I, yeah, okay, but things are so complicated, Paul, I don't even know where to start. And if you've ever felt that way, I want you to check out this video. Take a look at this and you'll, you maybe will relate. What are you up to, Max? Oh, come on, honey. I don't want to, I don't want to be filmed anymore. This manual is 39 pages long. And weird little charts and graphs and derking, derking, derking. I don't understand Swedish. And I have been sitting here for an hour on this one beam. This is like the wild west of furniture assemblage. This manual is, is got a hand, so do I have to point at the hole on the beam? There's a finger going like that, like it's pointing to the hole. Well, it doesn't, you... it doesn't actually use just regular human language to dictate what you're supposed to do. Hey, I think I got it, but still it's asking me to point at this hole. This is a nightmare. I'm already missing. I'm, I need another one of these and it's, it's nowhere to be found. We try to make it easy for you. Yeah, we know what? It's not easy. I can't screw. What they don't tell you is you cannot use these little things because you, you're working all day with them and they flip, they slip out of your hand. These two should be flipped because you don't want the one that's not painted black to be in the front. I'm, I'm seriously going to have a nervous breakdown right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you ever tried to put together that I can't? I mean, it's, some of you are probably really good at it. Um, but, uh, and you may feel that way from time to time in ministry, right? It's like, I don't want to know what to grab hold of. And I keep doing, and, and this just keeps going back this way. And, and so Paul does something interesting. Let's, let's get this first uh, uh, slide up here. Uh, that, that we're, we're spelling grace, right? And we're memorizing this passage, okay? So, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, okay? Get a grip on grace, that's the G. R, and the things which you've heard from me, these things entrust to faithful individuals who will be able to teach others also. Now watch what he does next. Paul is going to use three metaphors. He's going to give Timothy three word pictures uh, to help him have the right mindset of ministry. See, verse 2 is the mandate for ministry. Verse 1 is the means for ministry. And these next couple of verses in the next, uh, our next three sessions, basically, that's the mindset we need to have in ministry. And so Paul says, avoid excessive entanglements. Um, he says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier does not get entangled in civilian affairs so that he or she may be able to please the one who enlisted them. And so he's going to take on, first of all, of these three metaphors. The first one is the soldier. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll look at the athlete and then the farmer. Now you say, why does he pick these three? I'm not sure. We were common metaphors, common uh, occupations back then. But they were extremely important to Paul, and I'm convinced that he thought about these things a lot because this is his last letter. And in the last chapter of his last letter before he dies, he says these famous words. You know them. 
It's my epitaph. I have it written in my Bible so that my family knows if I ever have a headstone or something, uh, they will put on there, I have fought the good fight. That's what soldiers do. I have finished the course. That's what athletes do. I have kept the faith. And the word that he uses for keeping the faith is not like keeping it to yourself. The word is like to keep a garden. It's to cultivate a garden. And that's what farmers do. You see what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, Timothy, listen, I want you to understand. I want you to keep these three metaphors always in your mind because in this life, there's a war to be won, there's a race to be run, and there's a job to be done. So I want you to think like a soldier, and I want you to think like an athlete, and I want you to think like a farmer, and then he gives specifics about what he's talking about. And there's a lot of things you could talk about about those th three occupations. But Paul keeps it simple, which I'm not going to, but uh, it's probably a good idea. Uh, so there, there are a couple of things that he says here uh, about soldiering. Uh, he says, first of all, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I'm going to camp on that a little bit in this session. Because one of the things that really disturbs me is that there are all sorts of aberrant theologies out there that have nothing in the theology for suffering. And it is such a dominant theme in Scripture. I don't know how you can preach the gospel without talking about that subject and how God uses that subject. I don't know how you can point to Jesus Christ and what he endured on the cross without recognizing, huh, there may be something in this that says the only way to glory is we're going to have to experience some hardship. So this is what he says about a soldier. He says, first of all, a good soldier endures hardship. And listen, ministry is a really good place to find it. <laughs> I mean, soldier's life is a hard life. Uh, my neighbor, when, when, when I, we were still living in California, we were planting a church out there in the Bay Area, and my neighbor uh, grew up in a single, uh, with a single mom, and she worked long hours. Nobody could afford to live in San Francisco, so they drove an hour, an hour and a half out to our town and to where they lived. And so she wasn't home much and his, didn't have a dad at home, so I kind of became like a, a big brother to him. And we would run. I was running in those days. You know, I, I told you I was cycled. That's because... Athletes, when you're done with your athletic career, uh, you run to stay in shape, and then that hurts too much. So then you start riding a bike to stay in shape. And now I'm almost to the point in my life where now I'm into mall walking. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of where it goes next. Um, but I'm living next door to th th this family, and, and the young man's name is Vinny. And Vinny was a piece of work, man. Vinny had wild hair. I mean, kind of just... Uh, and but I, he's such a likable guy, and he was a runner at his school. So I figured out how I could develop a relationship. So Vinny and I would run together, and uh, I would ask him a lot of questions, not because I was really interested, but I just had to breathe. And so I let him talk while I breathed, because you know he could do it effortlessly. Uh, but we got pretty close. And so, you know, Vinny and I talked a lot about life together. And I'll never forget the day. Never forget it. It's sort of the spring, about this time of the year. And, uh, you know, in California, you got your front door open. You got a screen door there. And, and all of a sudden, I heard this, <laughs> Gary, Gary. So I, I go to the door. It's Vinny standing there. And he has this big smile on his face. I said, Vinny, what's up? He goes, guess what I just did? I said, Vinny, what did you, you know, endless possibilities. Um, but I said, what did you just do? He said, I joined the Marine Corps. Oh. And my first thought was, oh, no. And um, so I asked him the question, the Larry Walters question. Vinny, Why? Why did you join the Marine Corps? Are you ready for this? No, this is the truth. This is exactly what he said. He thought for a second and he said, well, he said, I guess I just got tired of my mom always telling me what to do. <laughs> this is some good thinking here. 
I didn't say it, but I thought, Vinny, you're going to meet some mothers in the Marine Corps that'll make your mother look like Mother Teresa. <laughs> but he didn't understand. See, here's what I think happened. And, and this happens in ministry, guys. I think Vinny idealized the military. He thought about getting to play with guns, riding in a tank, maybe a helicopter. He may have been told that the Marines uh, are often deployed on Navy ships so he could see the world. He may have heard that the military would pay for his education. But my guess is that no one bothered to tell him, and oh, by the way, you could die. Now, I'm thankful that he, honestly, I'm thankful that he did join the Marine Corps because I saw him six months later. That was a different individual. That wild hair, you know, when you join the Marine Corps, they say, how would you like it? <laughs> and so he had his buzz cut and he was, I mean, he was, and he was cut. And he walked over to the house and he was a different individual. It, he tr it was truly the best thing could have happened to Vinny. But it wasn't easy because I asked him, how, how, so how was it? Vinny he goes, oh man, it was so hard. Yeah. This is what Paul's saying to Timothy. Timothy, you're a soldier, man. Uh, it's going to be hard. And, and ministry, you know why ministry is hard? It's very simple. Uh, it's, it's not complicated. There is an unseen war going on for the souls of men and women taken captive by an unseen enemy. And so every day we're up against broken families and financial chaos and substance abuse, sexual confusion. All of these are just visible symptoms of an invisible war. And Paul tells Timothy to pursue ministry with the vigilance of a soldier. Guys, ministry is a call to arms. It's not a call to a picnic. Now, every day, you, you, as you leave this place and you continue on and you pursue ministry and you pursue making disciples and you pursue passing this stuff on and building a cathedral, you are going to run smack dab into two enemies, the woodpeckers and the termites. Those are your two greatest enemies. The woodpeckers uh, represent those external forces that will come against you and relentlessly attack your faith. It could be a difficult person because somebody that's just decided that they are against what you're for, it, it, you know, it, all of those sorts of things. I call those the woodpeckers. But you know, for me, the biggest struggle in ministry has not been the woodpeckers, it's been the termites. And the termites oftentimes are those people who are us and they cause dissension within the team. And the worst part, here's the worst part of it. Termites are those invisible forces within me that weakens my witness and accounts for most of my own self-inflicted suffering. I love what G.K. Chesterton said during World War II G.K. Chesterton responded to an article in the London newspaper, which the, the, it was a, a request for um, uh, opinions, uh, editorial opinions, and people could write in and answer a simple question. What's wrong with the world? I mean, we'd been through World War I, it was horrible, and then everybody thought that was the war to end all wars, and then came World War II, and then the Lin London Times says, what's wrong with the world? And there were all these long editorials about what was wrong with the world, and you know what the list would be. Oh, not enough education. Uh, oh, people are, don't, don't have enough money. Uh, you, you, all of that sort of thing. And G. K. Chesterton, genius that he was, he wrote in and sa he said, dear sir, with regard to the question, what's wrong with the world? I am, sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. See what he was saying? He was saying, look, I've got to face my own stuff. I, I've got forces at work. I, I am a child of God. I have, been, uh, I, I have been given life. I've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But I still have within me old patterns that are constantly raising their head and blowing me off course. 
Woodpeckers, external forces. Termites, internal forces. And those are what oftentimes causes our suffering. Now, as I say, I'm not talking about self-inflicted suffering, but let me just, let me just show you a couple things on slides here of what Paul says about suffering. He says in Philippians, he says to the Philippians, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. This comes, it, it comes with the package. Not self-inflicted suffering. He's just talking about the Philippians were suffering because they had aligned themselves with what at that time was a new religion um, that was offensive to the surrounding culture. What you and I believe is basically an offense to, to a lot of people in our culture today. I see this at Mercy Ships. It's, it's a struggle at Mercy Ships with, this, with respect to this. There are people ready to give us millions of dollars if only we won't talk about Jesus. Oh, that's a good deal. And what I say is, we, we, Mercy Ships, we talk about hope and healing. We're bringing hope and healing to the world's forgotten poor. And that's the two hands of the gospel. Hope is proclamational. Healing is incarnational. Uh, in, incarnation, the idea is that we have a message to bring to people, not just surgeries. Because here's the deal. If you look at the life of Jesus Christ... Uh, his miracles, <laughs> he didn't do miracles just to, to impress people. He wasn't like doing tricks. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. That's not why he did miracles. Do you know why he did miracles? Very simple. Those miracles confirmed his message. The message had priority. It was the message of the kingdom. And, and when Jesus went around, you'll see that in a minute. When Jesus went around teaching about the kingdom, he would talk about this kingdom. Someday you will be in a kingdom where there are no blind people. So let's go remove cataracts from people's eyes so they can get a taste of that kingdom. Someday you'll be in a kingdom where there are no crooked legs and where everybody will be able to walk and dance. So let's go do some surgeries to make, people, make sure some people can walk. And it's just a sign and a foretaste of what the kingdom of God's going to be like. But it won't be done without suffering. In fact, Peter uh, speaks of suffering as, it, as, as, as if it is a, uh, a, a means of grace. Check this out on the slide. It's 1 Peter 2. Listen to what Peter says. And this is the guy that had a lot to learn, right, when we talked about Jesus washing his feet. As an older man, he says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable, for this finds favor. Here it is, Jean-Claude, because Jean-Claude asked me if the word grace could also be translated favor. It was a great question. Here it is. It's translated in the English Bible here, favor. For this finds favor. The word is charis. It's grace. Uh, for this is grace, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person hears, bears up under sorrows <clears throat> when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds Favor or grace with God. And now notice the next words. <laughs> Blow your mind. Are you ready for this? You wonder what your calling is? Here it is. For you have been called for this purpose. Oh man, this doesn't play well in prosperity theology. You have been called for this purpose. What, is it? what do you mean? Well, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his being reviled. He did not revile while suffering. He uttered no threats. He just kept entrusting himself to the one who judges righteously. It's our calling. That we are so committed to cathedral building that no matter what the obstacle is, no matter how much we suffer, we're not going to quit. It's what happened to Jesus, and no disciple is above his teacher. 
But Jesus is, is, is not just an example of wrongful suffering. He's also the, purpose, the, the perfect example of purposeful suffering. <clears throat> um, it says Christ suffered that he might bring us to God. So his suffering was unique, the just for the unjust. And when we suffer, we're not bearing the wrath of God. We're not suffering in the same way Jesus did, who bore the wrath of God uh, to, to free us from our sin. But it becomes a powerful weapon when we bear up under suffering. It, Wayne Grudem, a theologian, <clears throat> he says it this way. Wrongful suffering, notice, not self-inflicted suffering. Wrongful suffering, patiently endured, is so remarkable that it becomes a powerful form of witness leading unbelievers to salvation. So Paul says, Timothy, it's going to be hard, and you're going to have to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And there are a lot of other places you can go, and you can see that. You know, for example, James Count it all joy, brethren. Isn't that a, don't you love quoting that passage to people that are struggling? Just count it all joy when you endure these serious trials. My favorite one is Peter, again, who's learned this um, over the course of his life. And, and, and in his letter, 1 Peter 4, uh, he says, Do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. What's the first thing we do? When something difficult happens in our life, oh man, why? Why is this happening to me? I'm trying to serve Jesus. I drive the speed limit. I paid my taxes last year. I, or maybe I didn't because I didn't earn enough. I don't know. I, I'm just trying to do everything right and this happens. It's, it's universal. This is why Peter goes, hey guys, don't be surprised. When this comes upon you, it comes upon you to test you. Don't think it's something strange, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, here's how this works. I, I, you, know, I, you know, when you're a preacher every day, I mean, every experience is an opportunity to look for an illustration. It kind of gets maddening after a while. One day we were in the Sequoia National Forest. And I love the sequoias and I love General Grant Tree and the beautiful redwoods. And, and we were looking around and standing in this cathedral. You talk about a cathedral. Those trees will force your eyes up. And I noticed a bunch of guys in orange jumpsuits and they were raking the forest. Now, I, nobody was asking this question, but it, you know, I just noticed this, and it just got weirder and weirder as I thought, how long will it take them to rake the whole forest? <laughs> These guys got job security for sure. So I went to the ranger thinking I was asking a dumb question. You know how they say there are no dumb questions? Yeah, there are. I've asked many of them. In fact, I got to tell you this. A few weeks ago, I buried a friend of mine. I didn't actually bury him, but I did his funeral. And, uh, and he, as he was dying, I had been gone for a week, and I wanted to get there in time. I, I hoped he wouldn't die while I was gone. He didn't. So I got there, and I went to this hospice where, where he was, and, and I sat down in the lobby of this hospice um, and waiting for his wife. She had been over at the funeral home talking to them about stuff. And, and uh, so I waited for her. And when she came in, we sat down. Oh, she was so glad to see me. She gave me a big up, Gary. I'm so glad you're here. She said, is there any way that you could do Chuck's funeral? Ready for this? I said, sure, when is it? <laughs> He's still alive. And she said, well, we were kind of waiting until. <laughs> well, that doesn't work with my schedule. Let's just do it now. <laughs> Dumb question. So I go to the forest ranger and I asked him what I thought was probably a dumb question. I said, excuse me, sir, but I've got to ask you this. Why are these guys raking the forest? They weren't, they weren't prisoners. I think it was like the California Conservation Corps. And, and uh, he said, that's a good question. I went, Phew. He said, here's the deal about sequoia trees. The way, the way Mother Nature uh, created sequoia trees 
is that they're the largest living things on the planet. Redwoods, sequoias are related. And, and, uh, and what they've been equipped with a nearly fire resistant bark. And they're conifers, so they have cones. And what happens in nature is that a spontaneous forest fire starts, lightning strike. The fire goes through the forest. It burns everything because these sequoia trees have a very shallow root system, so they don't tolerate competition well. And in the forest, all these other kinds of trees start to volunteer, and they interfere with the sequoia tree getting the nutrients it needs because even though they're massive, their root systems go way out into the forest. And so the way it was designed, the way God designed it, there'll be a forest fire, will burn up all of the competition... And because the sequoia has a fire-resistant bark, you can go to this day, you can go on the west coast of California, and if you ever see redwoods, you'll see some of them, they have scars on them, big black scars. They were in a forest fire, but it didn't kill them because their bark held up under all of that. And also, during that time, the fire got so intense that it released the seeds within the cone, because the only thing that can do it is a fire. And the fire releases the seeds within the cone and falls in the forest, and you got new redwoods. Now, why are the redwoods disappearing? I'll tell you why. Because we think we're so smart. Remember Smokey the Bear? Only you can prevent forest fires. Remember Frankenstein? Fire bad. So we took on that philosophy, and we decided, well, we're not going to let fires happen because those are bad. Fires are bad. So we're going to put them out. And as we developed fire technology in the forest many years ago, what happened was the redwoods started to disappear. Nobody made the connection for a long time. Because we were putting out the fire, they weren't able to reproduce. And because we were put, not putting out the fires, everything else was growing up around the sequoia, stealing nutrients from the trees. And they were disappearing. There are very few redwood forests left out there. We finally got wise to it. And so these guys are raking the forest because by hand they're eliminating the competition. Now, when, I was, when that guy got done telling me that, I, I, just, I just had one of those moments just in the midst of that sequoia grove. I thought, Lord, thank you so much for reminding me. Don't be surprised by those fiery trials that come into my life because they have a purifying effect. They, 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 have, they, they help me to reproduce, which is what you've called me to do. So a good soldier endures hardship because God will redeem that. Some of you are going through a really tough time right now. And you didn't ask for it. Now again, maybe you're going through a tough time because it's self-inflicted. If that's the case, then you need to, you need to deal with it. But there are sometimes, you know, it, it, you, it's not self-inflicted. You know, I don't know why young people get cancer. I, 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 I don't know why, you know, some people, some kids are born with defects. Um, and parents then have to deal with that. I, 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 don't, I don't know why. That, but God knows. And so as a good soldier, you endure hardship. Um. The second thing in this, this particular verse, as he's talking about a soldier, notice what he says. No soldier, this is verse 4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. And that's a big part of our problem in ministry. We get entangled. One of my favorite passages in Scripture, because it's good for pastors, especially when I teach pastors. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And I think we got a slide with it on it, but um, Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Jesus has just finished healing a bunch of people uh, at Peter's house. And so that evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick, all who were oppressed by demons. The whole city was gathered together at the door. He healed many who were sick with various diseases. He cast out many demons. Now, just You decided to become a follower of Jesus, and you're observing this stuff. Can you imagine? You're going, yes, yes. 
And he wouldn't allow the, permit the demons to speak because they knew him. By the way, this is a little aside, but you know, there's only two groups of people of individuals uh, that know who Jesus is. All of his own people. He came unto his own. They didn't recognize him. But there's always two groups that always recognize him. You know who they are, right? Centurions and demons. They always, you know, when Jesus heals the Gadarene demoniac, uh, the first thing the demon says to him, what do, you have, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? <laughs> he knows exactly who he is. Demons always know who Jesus is. It's his own people that don't know who he is. And so rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed because he loved solitude. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him and they found him and they said to him, are you ready for this? This is like music to the ears of a young pastor. Everyone is looking for you. You're popular. They want you. And he said to them, implied, they said to him, let's go back and do some more healing. There's still sick people there. I mean, this is pretty cool. We could start a ministry. We could hang out a sign. We could just settle there in Capernaum. And it's a lovely little seaside village. We'll, we'll be right there and we will help you. We'll be your assistants. And Jesus says the word that every one of you needs to learn to say. No. You've got to build up your no muscle. And Jesus, now, think, will you think about this with me? Come on. This is Jesus. This is the God of the universe. This is the Jehovah Jireh. This is the God who heals. And there's sick people there. And they invite him back to heal people. And he's going, uh-uh. Not doing it. What? They must have just gone, what is going on here? And notice what he says. That is, let's go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went through all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. If mercy ships could do surgeries to heal every person in Africa, we would have failed in our mission if they don't hear the gospel. You know why? Because that's healing that is only temporary. Because someday they're going to die. And what then? That's why I've always thought the saddest character in all the Bible is Lazarus. He dies and Jesus calls him out. And he's going, oh, great, I got to go through this all over again? <laughs> Everyone is looking for you. Jesus developed his no muscle. Do you know how he developed his no muscle? What was he doing out there? He's praying. Have you ever noticed this? If you were one of the disciples, <laughs> I mean, it'd be fun to ask this question around the tables. If Jesus walked in this room, what would you want to know from him? And when you read the New Testament, you realize that of all the things Jesus did, casting out demons, healing people, preaching incredible messages, his disciples never asked him how to do those things. There's only one thing they ever asked him to teach them to do. Lord, teach us to pray. There's something about his prayer life. And he taught them to pray. He showed them how to pray. Sober prayer. In fact, it's another thing that Peter said. He said, uh, near. be sober in your prayer life. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Because sober prayer reawakens our purpose, keeps us on course and protects us against the constant danger of mental intoxication. I think it's interesting that Peter uses that word. Um, he says, 
be of sober spirit. You know, sober. What is a sober spirit? Well, it sounds to me like it's the opposite of an intoxicated spirit. You know, how do you know when someone's intoxicated? They're just staggering from here to there. How do you know when somebody doesn't have a sober spirit? Well, they're into everything. They're in over here. They're in over there. And he says, no, no, no. You need to find time where you get with the Lord. And I know, listen, could we just, let's just be real. Nobody prays very well. I can't stand it when I hear something. Oh, we'll be praying for you. And there are times I want to go, no, you won't. No, I don't want to be terribly cynical about that. But it's almost like the Christian thing. Oh, that's that. Well, we'll be praying for you. Don't say that if you're not going to do it. Prayer is tough stuff. Man, I, I, I start my day with prayer. and some, You know how that works. Oh, Lord, it's, I'm so glad you've given me another day. And this is the day you've given me. And I want to be on target. And I need you to just lead me through this day. And I can't remember if I called that guy back or not. And what do I have going on next week? I need to look at my calendar. Uh, oh, wait, did I, did I close the garage door? Did I, uh, oh my gosh, there's, oh, they're picking up the trash already. I was supposed to take the trash out. I got to go get the trash. You experienced that? And Jesus is such a great model to us. Um, and, it, and it's sober prayer. My, uh, my, my daughter, <laughs> I had to help her understand what this meant because when she was in college, she was with a group of friends and she was driving and she got pulled over. And it was in college town. So the first question this police officer says is, young lady, have you been drinking? And my daughter had not been drinking and she said, no, sir, I've not been drinking. He said, you've had no, no alcohol. She says, no. She, he says, you're not incapacitated in any way. And she goes, oh, yes, sir. I've had driver's ed and I've had everything. She had no idea what incapacitated meant. I mean, she thought incapacitated meant, you know, you're certified or you, you know, you, you're not incapacitated in any way. Oh, yes, sir, I'm incapacitated. I went through driver's training and. <laughs> but if we're not sober, then we can easily be seduced by some of ministry's fatal attractions. I, I won't go into them, but I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, how about the myth of omnicompetence? You know, there are some communicable attributes of God. You know what that word means? And some incommunicable. In other words, there are some attributes of God that we share, like, like uh, uh, thinking, like loving. Uh, these are attributes of God that we share. There are some attributes of God that are incommunicable. We can't share those. He is all powerful. He's omnipotent. Guess what? You're not. Uh, he's omniscient. He knows everything. We're not. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere at the same place. And you can't be omnicompetent. But that's a fatal attraction. Another fatal attraction is the respect of the world. Uh, we go chasing the respect of the world. We want to be cool. We want to make sure we fit in. I, I'm, I grieve over churches that are trying to be cooler and cooler. Because you know what? You can't get there. You can't be cool enough. Um, wear the right clothes. Have a smoking hot band. Make some awesome videos. Be cool. It, it, the, the, you can't be cool enough with the people in this world and, and don't try. Now, I don't mean don't be contemporary. I mean, use your language of your generation in some ways. But don't overdo it. Um, and the last one is the myth of greener grass. That's just another temptation we have that blows us off course. The myth of greener grass. There's always, I, I one time read a book by John Steinbeck called Travels with Charlie. And uh, there was a line in that that I've always remembered. He says, to the restless soul, there is always better than here. And sometimes we just need to stay. And by the way, that's what Paul said to Timothy. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy 1, 3, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, stay where you are. Timothy wants out. He says, remain at Ephesus. Wow, he didn't want to hear that. 
So these are some of the temptations uh, that we have, and not that they're all bad, just beware of any good thing that becomes a God thing. Don't forget, we are idol factories. And, and good things can, you know, become godless things when it's not from God. Um, I learned that from my brother who was in the Air Force. He was stationed in Germany. And you need to pay attention to this because this happens to you and to me. And he, he wanted to live in the local village in Germany. And so he got a flat there and the man who spoke no English was the landlord. And he showed my brother around the place and he was explaining everything in German. And then when he got almost to the end of this little tour, uh, he went, opened up this closet and he pulls out a bottle, this amber bottle with liquid in it. And he hands it to my brother and he says, gift. And my brother's going, oh, well, that's nice. He's probably whipped up some homebrew and I've heard about this and he's thanking us for renting his place and he's giving us a gift. That's what he said it was, a gift. And my brother said, danke, danke. He took the bottle and the man goes, nine, nine, because he realizes my brother does not understand what means. Meanwhile, my sister-in-law's over there with a German dictionary and she looks up gift and to her horror, she realizes that in German, the word gift, anybody know? poison. Gift. And my brother almost poured himself a glass and enjoyed the last <laughs> drink of his life. It was rat poison. And the man was saying to him, if you'll sprinkle this around in this room, the rats will stay away. Gift. How many times does that happen? Satan reaches out to us, gift gift. And if we're not sober, if we're not prayerful about it, we just reach out and take it. Last thing. So a good soldier endures hardship. A good soldier avoids excessive entanglements by being sober with respect to prayer. And then the last thing, notice what he says here. He says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Why? because his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. A good soldier pursues the pleasure of God. Paul is very honest with Timothy about pastoral pitfalls, but his focus was on, not on the pain of ministry, but the pleasure of God. Like when you endure hardship, this finds favor with God. Jesus himself, it says in Hebrews 12 too, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross despising the shame. What was Jesus thinking about? He's thinking about the pleasure of his father. Um, my friend Bob is a pastor and he's a good pastor. And uh, he moved here. He's actually from Lindale, Texas. His dad was the pastor of First Baptist Lindale. And Bob came here to the Metroplex and started a church. And I was with Bob one day, and he was telling me the story, because that church now is this incredibly missions-minded force uh, in, in this area. And he told me the story about how when he started out, man, nothing was working. He was trying all the cool stuff. He'd put on skinny jeans, uh, you know, uh, spiked his hair back in those days and, and just, you know, lifted weights and wore a real tight shirt, um, thinking that he could draw a crowd because that kind of had been his model and he wanted to be cool. And he tried everything and the church wouldn't grow. I mean, he would sit there, Lord just, we want to grow. I want to expand. You know, that's, we, I know the nature of the kingdom is to expand and that's all I want to do, Lord. That's all I want to do. So help us to grow. Nothing. And finally one day he was so discouraged and he was sitting there having his prayer time with the Lord. And he said, I didn't even know what to pray anymore. And he said, there in the silence, God spoke to me, not with an audible voice, but it was unmistakable what God was saying to me in my spirit. I heard it this way. God said to him, Bob, when will I be enough for you? 
When will I be enough for you? It reminded me so much, Leland, of of the the story told uh, in uh, Are You Really There, God? When Mercy Ships was being started and uh, Lauren was over there and there was this meeting about the ship and all this stuff and everybody was preoccupied with the ship and they were all discussing the ship and they were all focused on the ship. And Lauren says God gave him a vision in that moment that Jesus was on the other side of the room. And while we were arguing about details related to this ship, that Jesus was over there completely ignored. And I would say to you, be very careful that you don't get so focused on the work of the Lord that you forget completely the Lord of the work. Because that's who we want to please. That's our goal in life. Um, can I just say to you as we close this session, seek the pleasure of God because I want you to know this. You need to hear this. There's some of you in here especially need to hear this. God is pleased with you. God is crazy about you. You're the apple of his eye. Now, obviously, there are times when you might do something that he's displeased with, he'll, he'll be faithful to discipline you. That's why I never use the phrase out of fellowship with God. Because I don't think you can be out of fellowship with God. I understand what people mean by that. But God doesn't come and go. The Holy Spirit doesn't come and go. Like my little daughter, my firstborn, one day she was doing something. She was about four years old. She was writing on the wall with a crayon and her mom saw her and said, Aaron, and it scared her because she realized she was busted. And she looked at my wife and she said, Mommy, you just blew Jesus right out of my heart. (laughs) Because she had some feeling, her heart fluttered, and she thought, well, there he goes. This is your deal, you're on your own now. See, it's not the way it works. You'll never be out of fellowship with God. Now, you might be under discipline, That's not fun, but he loves you. He's crazy about you. He is for you. And you know what you have to do to please him? You know what you really have to do to get him to love you? This is very important. You know what you have to do to get God to love you? Nothing. I'm going to show you one of the best looking grandkids on the planet here on this slide. (laughs) I love this picture. There's a photo here I want you to see. This is about, oh, it's probably about four years old now. This is my little grandson at Children's Hospital. And he had some, I don't know what they call it. Some of you would know RPV or SPV or RPZ. Or, it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty serious virus in the lungs of a little guy that doesn't have very big lungs. And my daughter snapped this because I was so worried about him. And so while I was talking to him, looking down at him, look at him, he's just... He's going, man, I hope I'm as handsome as that guy someday. (laughs) I mean, it was so cool. His eyes were so fixed on mine, and I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, dude, you are the most precious thing in the world. And that's how God feels about you. Man, when parents stand there over that crib and look at that baby, they're not going, oh, can't wait till you can mow the lawn. (laughs) They're not looking down going, You know, when are you going to do something, man? You're just an eating, pooping, crying machine. (laughs) They don't think. They look and go, oh, that's my my baby. And God looks at you. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at us here. He goes, man, these are my children. He loves you. And so give him back some love. Seek to please him. You don't have to be perfect. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. But give him some love. Accept his grace. Take on the challenge to pass this faithful witness on to others. And don't forget, live your life like a soldier, enduring hardship, avoiding excessive entanglements with the world, having your primary focus, the pleasure of God. Lord Jesus, I know, I know that you're pleased by those who are here this weekend. A lot of other stuff we could be doing. 
But Lord, we're here. We want to hear from you. And I thank you for each and every man and woman in this place. And Lord, continue to lead us and guide us for your glory, not ours. And we pray that everything we do would be pleasing to you in Jesus' name. Amen.